Good afternoon, everyone. I hope everyone is doing well today. I would like to welcome everybody to today's webinar, Improving Housing Conditions in Rural Communities, Sharing Local Best Practices to Build Stakeholder Capacity. My name is Samara Mentley, a project coordinator for the National Environmental Health Association. Uh, please allow me, I'm just going to cover some few housekeeping items before we get started. I'd like everybody to note that the webinar is being recorded. The uploads will go to both organizations' websites, so you can find them there. We are going to take a few questions from the attendees during the panel discussion, and please feel free to drop those questions in the Q&A box during that time. At the conclusion of our webinar, everybody will receive a link to participate in our evaluation, where you're gonna be able to provide some feedback and comments on today's webinar. With that, please let us begin. Niha and the National Center for Healthy Housing welcome you to today's webinar. Both organizations have been partnering together for almost five years on several initiatives that have focused on improving housing conditions, Resources such as cleaning guides during the COVID pandemic, healthy housing checklists during extreme cold and heat, green building code comparisons, and a number of webinars covering different topics on protecting homes during extreme weather. The goal of this partnership is to build healthy housing communities through tools, resources, and education. I'd like to introduce everybody to our moderator for today's webinar, Chris Walker. Chris Walker is a senior program analyst for the Programs and Partnership Development Department at the National Environmental Health Association, and he represents the DC staff. Chris works really closely with key partners on grant funded projects um, pertaining to topics of general environmental health and emergency preparedness. He also provides technical support on NEHA's vector program, preparedness, and the informatics committees. Prior to working with NEHA, Chris practiced in both the public and the private sectors in the field of environmental health for over 18 years in the states of North Carolina, Virginia, and Maryland. Chris received his Bachelor of Science and his Master of Science degrees in environmental health from East Carolina University. Chris is an educator at heart and he relishes in the opportunity to teach and be a resource to others. So there's Chris, please take it away. Thank you very much, Samara. Uh, and thank you all for attending uh, and viewing this webinar. Uh, one thing that we wanted to share uh, about this webinar um, is just the fact, just with the different things going on uh, in rural housing, we wanted to first um, identify those challenges. Uh, in rural housing areas, uh, those communities face different uh, challenges compared to others who may live in uh, urban, suburban areas. So this was a great opportunity to kind of understand what is going on. Uh, also, we wanted to share some of the resources that uh, we've generated uh, to help support these communities, to support the stakeholders that are working in rural housing, uh, to support the ones who may identify uh, funding revenues or avenues for them as well as trying to learn, we're gonna have a panel discussion later on today to better understand you know, uh, boots on the ground, the ones that are actually working um, in rural communities, the ones that are providing support to rural communities uh, to understand you know, their challenges, the opportunities, the things that they've learned when it comes to uh, trying to provide that level of support. Uh, so we're making sure that we're trying to bring uh, like minds together uh, in order to learn more and to provide, uh, meet the need to those that are living in these housing communities. Uh, and I do want to point out that this webinar was made possible through funding uh, from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Now, uh, we understood that there were housing challenges uh, in rural communities, but didn't really know the specifics. Um, you could identify certain things, but you know, not 100% sure. As we know, just in different areas, uh, one challenge in one particular community may vary compared to uh, another location. So this was uh, an opportunity to try to 
understand uh, some of the topics, even when it comes to health equity. How were uh, residents, people living in uh, those communities, are they able to receive the same resources? And when you're living in rural communities, it's not easy to get to some of the resources or get to offices or uh, be connected to um, businesses or agencies that are convenient. Some you have to kind of drive further away. Uh, as well, we wanted to identify even the, the risk, you know, who are the ones that are most susceptible uh, when it comes to residents and people living in rural uh, communities. Uh, we wanted to identify, you know, the living conditions. How are the, that, the housing stock? Are, are they in good condition? You may have homes that uh, may still have uh, lead paint. You may have some areas that may be suffering from any type of environmental health issues, from mold and vector control, uh, air quality, uh, to a number of other things. Um, and even with that, in uh, rural and frontier communities, there are some uh, residents that may not necessarily know that resources are available. So it's a great opportunity to understand where the gaps are and how uh, NEHA, as well as National Center for Healthy Housing, can try to meet some of those needs and understand some of those challenges. Um, and even understanding some of the impacts when it comes to uh, climate change, uh, whether you're looking at uh, well water, private wells that may be compromised, uh, the housing foundation may be compromised due to you know, extreme flooding. Uh, so now you start having air quality issues that may come about, you know, extreme heat, extreme cold. Uh, how's the, how will the housing area be able to accommodate and be able to keep people protected on the inside? And then we talked about air quality with the, you know, wildfires, uh, smoke events, those types of things. How is that impacting the health of people living in those homes? Um, now to provide support, uh, you first need to understand the unique challenges facing these communities. Uh, and I would like to introduce uh, Anna Planky, uh, analyst at the National Center for Healthy Housing to talk more about how we identify those challenges and needs and how we're also working to meet them. Uh, just a little background about Anna. Anna has been uh, with National Center for Healthy Housing since January of 2019. Uh, she holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in History of Public Policy from University of California in Santa Barbara. Santa Barbara. Uh, Anna, the floor is yours. Great. Thanks, Chris. Um, so as mentioned, my name is Anna. I'm an analyst with the National Center for Healthy Housing. And before we jump into our panel discussion, I just wanted to talk a little bit more about this webinar and the project. So Chris um, just spoke about why our two organizations decided to collaborate on this topic and some of the healthy housing challenges in rural communities and how those are unique to rural communities versus their urban counterparts. Um, and given our, um, you know, given that context, we set out to hear directly from those communities um, and those that are providing healthy housing or environmental health services and to really hear about what their needs are and how um, you know, national organizations like ours can be responsive to those needs. Um, so part of meeting the need um, is to identify where public health and healthy housing professionals like us um, can help assist bridge those gaps through either you know, creating resources, facilitating connections, or simply just amplifying and disseminating information that already exists. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. So in November of last year, NCHH and NEHA disseminated the Identifying Needs of Rural Healthy Housing Organizations questionnaire. Um, the goal of this questionnaire was just to hear from organizations providing these healthy housing and environmental health services in rural areas and communities. Again, just about their needs, the challenges that they're facing and future opportunities and maybe some really interesting strategies that they're using. Um, so with that, um, you know, the goal was also to help inform our development of future resources and tools from both NEHA and um, NCHH to support these organizations. Um, this questionnaire was open from November of 2022 to late January of 2023. Um, and it was really open to any organization working on healthy housing or environmental health um, in rural areas. And we let, um, you know, respondents define those terms however they wanted. Um, 
And at the final closing, the questionnaire had 180 responses and the responses included those located, located in or providing services to 37 states. Um, some of the major key takeaways um, included um, that we also put into a report are that um, you know, public health was the primary focus for most of the respondents to that questionnaire and rural public health um, professionals really see um, housing as a key issue. Um, a majority of respondents said mold and energy efficiency are problems in their community. Um, respondents report that low income residents and residents of color are disproportionately impacted um, and that they report barriers to accessing healthy housing services. Respondents also told us that they're highly interested in receiving technical assistance on increasing health equity um, and resident access to services um, to address hazards in the home. Respondents um, also told us, you know, they have challenges securing funding, um, especially for home repairs. And lastly, in terms of sort of, you know, opportunities and strategies, um, innovative projects that were identified by our respondents focus on partnerships and on training and capacity building for communities. Next slide. So in addition to the questionnaire, um, again, in late 2022 and early 2023, both NCHH and NEHA held a series of informal roundtable discussions with various stakeholders. Um, these roundtables were intended to facilitate conversations between participants um, themselves and for us to also gather some information on, you know, from those who are working on the ground about these existing strengths and unique strategies in place, as well as, you know, the current needs in rural communities. So during this time, NCHH and NEHA held three of these roundtable discussions with 10 different individuals um, who are, you know, directly engaged in this work in rural areas. And some of the key takeaways from those um, conversations you know, mirror the stuff that we heard in the questionnaire, but um, also notably are that, you know, the housing in many rural and tribal communities have just a variety of healthy housing and environmental health issues. You know, it's not just one, there's multiple issues going on. Um, we heard that, again, that mold is a healthy housing issue um, for, for the stakeholders that we spoke to. And um, they also brought up just the, the housing stock, the age of the housing stock. They said, you know, there are many older homes in these communities and they've just been, um, you know, they haven't been updated or maintained for many years um, and that they have significant structural issues. Next slide. Okay, um, so yeah, next, um, during this process from both those conversations, um, you know, the roundtable discussions and the questionnaire, um, NIHA then recruited and held um, rural and frontier working groups. Um, and that has actually resulted in an environmental rural health committee. Um, and I'll let Chris kind of talk more about that um, as we close out um, at the end here. Next slide. All right. And lastly, before we jump in and meet our panelists, um, I just wanted to point out some new and upcoming resources from this partnership from NCHH and NEHA. Um, so in addition to the questionnaire report that I had just referenced, um, we created sort of two pairs of resources. So the first um, is the Rural Healthy Housing and Environmental Fact Sheet and Primer. And these two you know, provide an insight into some of the ways healthy housing issues are you know, manifesting in rural communities and how these issues um, intersect with concerns about, um, about equity. And then the last kind of pair there are um, the federal funding for healthy homes um, fact sheet. And then we also added an applicant, but, um, applicant guide. They provide an overview of available federal programs from agencies like the, you know, the USDA, from HUD, from EPA. Um, and they provide um, information about the funding to rural communities, both from, you know, to organizations, individuals, and it also includes eligi eligibility requirements and how to apply for that funding. Um, so those are the resources and kind of an overview. And then I will kick it back over to Chris to introduce our panelists and get our discussion going. Awesome. Thank you for that, Anna. And thank you for the National Center for Healthy Housing for uh, just the partnership and the work that we've been doing together. So now uh, it is a pleasure to introduce 
uh, our panelists. So first, I do want to introduce Brandon Kemperman. Uh, Brandon is a healthy building scientist with public health, Seattle, Seattle and King County in Washington State. Uh, he graduated from the University of Washington with a BS in environmental science and holds certifications in industrial hygiene, school risk management, and playground safety. Uh, with over 15 years of occupational health and safety experience, he now serves as technical advisor for the public health uh, Seattle and King County K-12 School Environmental Health and Safety Program, uh, which covers approximately 700 public and private schools in the county. He also utilizes his industrial hygiene expertise to address emergent complex health and safety problems to help keep communities in the county safe. Uh, when not focusing on health and safety, he loves spending time with his wife and two children outdoors in the beautiful Pacific Northwest. Uh, we now go to uh, Heather Blum, uh, which is the environmental health professional uh, for a rural health department in Northeast Wisconsin. Uh, for the past three years, Heather has helped the residents of her county with the air and water quality, food safety issues, and emergency preparedness and human health hazards. Uh, Heather worked in occupational safety and health at NASA for six years and has also served as part-time faculty instructor in microbiology for an area college. She holds a Bachelor of Science degree in human biology for the University of Wisconsin-Green Bay and a Master of Public Health degree from the Medical College of Wisconsin. Uh, Heather is a licensed registered sanitarian in Wisconsin, a registered environmental health specialist with uh, the National Environmental Health Association, and is also a certified lead risk assessor in Wisconsin. In her free time, she likes to spend time and with her family, travel and learn about nerdy things, and all under the watchful eye of her dog who thinks she's cool, but is also pretty sure needs supervision. So we welcome Heather. And lastly, we like to welcome Keegan McChesney. Uh, Keegan is a program officer at Local Initiative Support Corporation, uh, which is focused on affordable housing, equitable, sustainable, development in rural communities. Uh, with experience in affordable housing, climate, and environmental health, he can provide technical assistance, manages grants, and supports policy advocacy. He oversees rural uh, list healthy housing initiatives, which has provided nearly $4 million in grants for healthy green homes across rural America. His previous experience includes roles at Enterprise Community Partners, as well as various public agencies and community-based organizations. He holds a joint international master's of science and sustainable development from universities in Germany, Italy, and India, as well as a bachelor's degree in urban and environmental policy from Occidental College. So Keegan, welcome. So now we're going to stop sharing. And we welcome our panelists to show themselves so we can get this party rolling. So I'm going to first start our panel discussion first with Brandon. Uh, and Brandon, if you don't mind, just giving a brief introduction and description of your role and the program when it comes to uh, supporting housing communities in rural areas. Yeah, thank you so much, Chris. Um, so specifically in public health, Seattle King County, I'm part of the school environmental health and safety program. And so with over 500 public schools and 200 private schools, we have some of those located uh, within rural areas. Um, and so um, key components of that program include like school plan review, um, inspections, and then also technical assistance. But then if I shift over to housing, we also receive calls um, geared towards issues that um, residents are experiencing, such as indoor quality, and then also uh, mold issues, which is another big one uh, that we get calls about. Yes, uh, I'm, I'm sure there are a number of issues dealing with mold. So uh, thank you for sharing that. Uh, Heather, same question. If you can just uh, briefly describe your role uh, and the program uh, that you support when it comes to rural housing. Sure. Thanks, Chris. 
Um, yeah, so I'm the environmental health professional for the O'Connor County Health Department. So tiny place uh, north of Green Bay. Um, we have about 38,000 people in our county. Um, so our public health is part of our health and human services for the county. So um, as part of my, my role um, here, I also do the emergency preparedness for public health and also for our, um, our health and human services. So basically, I administer our drinking water quality programs, environmental investigations for elevated blood lead in children, the radon uh, program, human health hazard inspections, pretty much if it has to do with environmental health, uh, I'm your one-stop shop. I'm the only environmental health person that we have. So I enjoy that greatly. The jack of all trades. So uh, yes, that, that's what happens in rural communities sometimes. Uh, Keegan, if you don't mind introducing and describing uh, your role as well as the program uh, focus on rural housing. Thanks, Chris, and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Keegan. I'm with LISC, the Local Initiative Support Corporation, which is a national nonprofit and community development financial institution with offices around the country. And we have a rural team that works with rural communities across the country and every state and some of the territories, as well as Native nations. Our rural team has a variety of programs that we work on, um, including affordable housing. And within our affordable housing work, I help manage our Healthy Housing Initiative, which since 2015 has been providing grants to community-based organizations across the country who are doing amazing work related to housing rehabilitation and production to help create more healthy homes in rural communities across the country. Amazing. Uh, so I, I know you all are doing wonderful things, uh, but since this is our focus when it comes to uh, rural housing, I do want to, Brandon, I'll start with you. Um, what housing hazard uh, has been the hardest to address uh, in your community? Yeah, I would say the most emergent one that has come up recently is um, climate impacts from both extreme heat and then also wildfire smoke. So in our rural communities, especially in our schools too, um, you know, wildfire smoke uh, has been impacting our communities more often and more severely as of late in the last couple of years. And so, um, you know, we have uh, emergency management department and then also us being the school EHNS team, we can respond to um, those wildfire smoke issues and provide technical support. And then also we have a team that can distribute like portable air cleaners and also box fan filters. So um, we can provide support um, also to businesses and daycares and um, other sectors to help support them and um, prevent wildfire smoke exposure. And then also provide technical assistance um, around extreme heat. Th th those are two uh, at the forefront issues uh, with that extreme heat and, and then just trying to deal with wildfire smoke. So uh, thank you for the work that y'all are doing. Um, Heather, I'll go to you, same thing. Uh, what are in your area that you're uh, supporting in Wisconsin, uh, what housing hazard has been the hardest to address? I think in my neck of the woods, I have to say uh, just affordable housing that's safe. I think we're stretched really thin. Um, the Wisconsin Realtors Association actually a couple of days ago just released a report saying that we're only at about half of what we need um, in the state for our housing inventory. So uh, we have a lot of people that are moving in. And my little County in the last, I think since the 70s, we've had a net migration in of about 53%. So uh, we have to find places to put everyone. And you couple that with, um, well, there was COVID and then issues with the economy and also the challenges of rural, um, getting structures fixed up, which is what you guys mentioned when you first opened the webinar uh, is proving to be an issue. We're seeing a lot of um, elderly staying longer in their homes because they can't afford um, long-term care. And so uh, they're trying to figure out how to get their uh, needs met on a fixed income. And 
um, we're not seeing the housing turnover uh, so we can get millennials into affordable housing. So uh, housing is starting to really become a priority here. And, I, and just from what you're talking about, um, I guess a, a low stock, but the, the quality is not where it needs to be for people to live in their homes uh, and feel safe from a health standpoint. So a uh, very good point. Uh, Keegan, um, I, within your organization, uh, what hazard uh, has been the hardest to address uh, in communities that you serve? Mm -hmm. Both Brendan and Heather's answers are quite resonant and we work in communities across the country who all have varied needs and hazards that they're addressing, but I can say that housing quality and housing supply are issues across the board. Um, and increasingly, climate impacts, extreme weather are also big challenges that are exacerbating both the housing supply and the housing quality issues. Um, some of our partners have been utilizing increasingly in recent years our healthy housing grants to do rehabilitations to address climate hazards, um, as Brandon mentioned, wildfire smoke, so improving ventilation in existing homes. Um, to help deal with wildfire smoke, extreme heat and extreme cold. We have a lot of our partners who utilize these resources to do weatherization, um, to help with insulation and heating and cooling systems. And we also have some of our partners, for example, in Mississippi who are doing housing recovery, helping folks whose homes have been impacted by hurricanes and flooding, extreme wind events. Um, helping to repair their homes. Oftentimes there's mold remediation that needs to be done. Um, so those are some of the many challenges that our partners are facing on the ground. Uh, thank you all. Uh, a number of challenges. I think we're all pointing those things out. Now moving forward, uh, and I'm gonna go to Heather, uh, just how has your organization been able to build capacity among healthy housing and environmental health professionals? Oh, that's one of my favorite topics. Thank you for that, Chris. Um, so rural, like you said, you wear a lot of hats. So that also means making a lot of friends. So um, I've started having conversations with my local building inspectors. What can they help to augment in my programs? And what are they seeing? We're on a first name basis. We'll call each other and and pick each other's brains. Um, we've got uh, meetings set up with the town chairs. What are you seeing? Um, what do you need? What kind of stuff is, is going on where you are and, and how can I help you meet, uh, meet that uh, challenge? Also, um, there's some interesting things that are happening uh, in my state. We do, every month we do um, quarterly meetings for lead. So we train all of the lead folks. Um, we all sit in on these webinars and, and learn the latest and greatest things going on with, with lead in the state. Um, our Bureau of Environmental and Occupational Health put out a training needs assessment for all the um, health departments so that they could see what kind of things their environmental health professionals uh, needed. So that was a, a great barometer. It was great because then we all got to see kind of um, where is everybody? And there have been some neat working groups too. Um, our land and water conservation people in the state have started buddying up with, with public health. And so we have this great crossover of, well, this is what we're doing over here and this is what we're doing over here. So let's look at the environmental side while we look at the health side. And it's wonderful. We're all learning from each other. So um, that kind of, of networking is so vital for all of us in, in rural because everybody's got to pull the wagon. So enjoying having those conversations with people. Uh, thank you, Heather. That is a, a great point. And just that partnership, just bringing, um, we're never going to be the experts of everything, uh, but if you identify the right people together collectively, we can kind of help uh, address some of the needs and issues that are in these areas. Uh, Keegan, um, same thing. Uh, how have you been able to build capacity uh, among healthy housing and environmental health professionals? How have you kind of built those partnerships? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, we have another grant program called the Capacity Building Grant Program, which is funded by HUD, which is an 
intentionally focused on building the capacity of community development corporations, community housing focused organizations. And so we have been in the capacity building field for quite some time. And I think there are many strategies depending on the capacity of each individual organization, but some strategies that prove effective include peer learning. Since we have such a great network of organizations across the country, we're talking to frequently if someone's working on something that might be new to their organization that another has been working on for a decade, we can connect them and help share expertise. Um, we also hold a annual seminar um, where we gather rural community development leaders from across the country together, as Heather mentioned, for networking opportunities, for training, for education, um, which is a great way for folks to learn and to grow the capacity of their organization. And then I think operational funding, um, ensuring that there is funding to support staff to go to trainings, to participate in peer learning, um, and to know there's that consistency to continue to grow the staff of the organization to do the work is also vital. Oh, wow, there's a, a lot of positive things that you've shared. Um, and feel free if you have any of those uh, links, uh, feel free to kind of share that uh, with our attendees in the chat. I think that would be something great and useful for them to have. Uh, I do want to let the attendees know we do have our Q&A box. Uh, if you have any questions that you would like to ask our panelists, uh, just dealing with um, rural housing um, and any type of questions kind of pertaining to that. Um, I do want to kind of understand the types of partnerships within Seattle and King County. So, um, Brandon, I want to ask that same question, you know, how have you been able, or how has your organization been able to uh, build the capacity among those professionals? Yeah, I think that's a wonderful question. And, you know, my position did not exist a year ago. Um, so we, my position was created as part of foundational public health service funding uh, within the state. Um, and so I think seeking grant funding helps us to build our programs and hire staffing to help serve the communities better. Um, and then also breaking down silos within our own organizations to help leverage other professionals within other programs in our organization so that then we can work together and help address some of those environmental health issues that are coming up in our community and even emergent, you know, um, like climate change. So, um, and, and impacts from that, like wildfire smoke and extreme heat and then others like flooding. So um, I think just really collaborating, working together, breaking down those silos, and then also forming relationships with community-based organizations to help build their capacity to then communicate and train them so that they can spread the word about some of the solutions that might help the communities with respect to environmental health issues that they're facing. Okay, and that's good. And and one thing that you pointed on, Brandon, that if you don't mind just kind of going into a little more detail, you talked about bringing in uh, community groups. Um, how important is that, you know, with, you know, trying to reach out to different audiences and different uh, groups uh, with that live in rural communities? Uh, just talk about that as far as the, the value that is working with uh, particular communities. Yeah, I think forming uh, deep and meaningful relationships with community-based organizations is super important because they understand what the needs are of, and, and probably how to communicate within those communities the best, you know, and it helps kind of facilitate a conduit between local health jurisdictions or, you know, city government, local munip municipalities mm -hmm. to help um, communicate, uh, translate even. So if there are language access um, barriers that might be present, then the community-based organizations could help translate themselves the materials and then get the information to the communities. So I think it's really important to form those relationships with the CBOs so that they can be that interface between the community and whatever government entity is you know, trying to assist them. Uh, that is a, a great point. Uh, well said. Uh, Keegan, um, I'm going to go to you. Uh, if you can, just describe some of the best practices or models that you've seen have success in the communities that you've helped to uh, support. Um, and then, if anything, these practices or models, are these 
uh, practices something that can be shared or emulated across uh, similar communities? Absolutely. Thanks for the question. I'm going to break it down into four buckets um, of best practices that we see organizations utilizing our healthy housing funds to support. Um, starting with single family home rehabilitation programs, which help to connect with low income homeowners who often have deferred maintenance needs, um, environmental health issues that need to be addressed, but folks don't have the income or resources to do the rehabilitation. So community-based organizations having relationships with folks in their communities and helping them to access the resources, um, bringing in an, an inspector to see what are the most pressing issues to be addressed, and then helping to actually do those um, projects, do the rehab and incorporating education so that homeowners can also be empowered to do the maintenance. Um, and that often includes weatherization, like insulation, new windows, new roofing, remediating mold, heating and cooling systems, those kind of things. Um, so that's weatherization, which is also getting a lot more federal funding. And I think we're gonna need more community-based organizations to help do the implementation and reach the most vulnerable households. Um, and there's multifamily rehabilitation. So a lot of apartment buildings, um, which may be subsidized low-income housing, also often have a lot of deferred maintenance needs, and it can be hard to find the funding to do the rehabilitation to improve those properties to make them more healthy and safe. So for instance, replacing old carpets with low VOC flooring um, to improve the ventilation systems like we were talking about to address wildfire smoke, those kind of things um, are really necessary. And thankfully there are also some new resources through the Inflation Reduction Act. HUD has a new program, the Green and Resilient Retrofit Program, which is open now um, for folks that manage uh, subsidized, HUD subsidized housing um, to help pay for some, uh, some rehab. Then there's multifamily new construction and we're seeing a lot of innovation in that space for um, net zero building, green building, that's both really efficient and environmentally friendly and also really healthy. So I think um, as much as there's opportunities for new construction, subsidized construction, um, also supportive housing is often also incorporating health services directly into those buildings. So we also love to support new construction of affordable and supportive housing. And then finally, there's programming. So connecting with residents just to help educate folks on healthy living practice, how to maintain their living spaces, whether they're renters or homeowners. And those are, are some of the best practices we see that are replicable across uh, communities. Uh, that, that's quite a nice list. Uh, so it's, it's nice to see that there are programs and some of the things that are uh, meant to help support, but also empower people that are living in those homes because uh, it's nice for people to kind of be their own resource and their own solution to address some of those uh, hazards within the home. Uh, Brandon, uh, same question, you know, if you can um, describe some best practices or models uh, you've seen have success in uh, the community that you serve, and if that's something that can be emulated and shared across uh, communities alike. Yeah, definitely. I think um, I think one good program that can serve as a model is our COVID-19 recovery program on indoor air quality. So um, some of the services that were established um, as part of that program during the pandemic have carried over past, you know, the pandemic emergency. Um, and so the, the program provides indoor air quality technical assistance as requested to like to all sectors really within um, King County, such as daycares, long-term care facilities, and businesses, and so um, the, anybody can really go and fill out a form that's on our website and request technical assistance and even a site visit around like indoor air quality at their at their area. So, um, so the staff from the program can travel to the requester's facility and perform an indoor air quality evaluation to identify the issue or issues. Um, and then make recommendations on how to address those issues. So um, 
you know, when, when they go out to do these assessments, they can also um, identify if maybe there's an issue with like indoor air quality, maybe airborne particles are um, generated in the area. And so they can provide a portable air cleaner or a box fan filter to that person or individual or even business. Um, and thousands of box fan filters have been distributed as part of that part of that program. So it's been pretty amazing over the last few years. Um, and so I think um, I think it's been a really good lesson for that program and they've established a really nice program. And one of the best solutions I think was implementing that online form so that the people can fill out that form and get assistance. So I think that can serve as like a nice model um, indoor air quality sort of technical assistance program. I think that, that's nice. And uh, I, I think, and I mean, the next question, if you don't mind, just, just talking about lessons learned, uh, just talking about that form itself that feels like something that maybe y'all didn't have in the beginning, but uh, that it proved to be beneficial in being able to get people to be able to complete that online form. Yeah, I think um, everybody was sort of flying by the seat of their pants during the pandemic, trying to come up with solutions to address issues. And so, you know, anytime you can streamline something, I think that was really beneficial. And I wasn't around at the start of that program, but the, the people that are managing that program have done a really nice job at, at developing it. Um, and so, you know, kudos to them, I think, um, in getting that program going. Um, and I was going to say one other thing, but I but I forgot now. <laughs> so <laughs> We'll come back to you uh, at some other point, but uh, yeah, just keep that thought for later. Uh, so Heather, haven't heard from you in a while, so I'm just going to go to you. Um, if you can share just within your organization, what are some of the most exciting synergies that you've seen develop within your organization? Well, uh, Chris, I thought uh, one of the most exciting things that happened, it kind of happened by accident. Um, I was having a discussion with our child care coordinator. She's uh, another part of Health and Human Services. And we talked about the fact that our county was a child care desert and um, providers were having problems keeping staff and that sort of thing. So we ended up coming up with this program that I'll probably touch on later, but it, it has to do with um, environmental health in, in child care uh, situations. But what was really interesting is we had this group of, of providers basically, right? And we were like their, their go-to people and, and, um, and they were ours. And, and we had this great, this great networking back and forth with them. But what was really cool is right about that time, the state uh, rolled out a program um, called the, uh, the Lead in Daycare um, program. And so what it was, um, was for the licensed group daycares, you would do water sampling. And if, any of their fixtures came back as contaminated with lead, then uh, they got all new fixtures uh, free of charge. So all the sampling, all the fixtures, all of that. Um, and that was great. I mean, it was every one of our um, participants in the other program um, who were eligible, every single one of them enrolled in that, in that program. And they've all made it through now. And it was just talk about right place, right time. It just, everything came together. It was it was really nice. That, that, that's amazing. I, that, that's a a very happy accident. It <laughs> so it, it's nice that uh, you were able to get something from that. Uh, so that, that's amazing. Uh, I do want to go to Keegan. I know you shared some information, but I would also, if you don't mind, just describe uh, an exciting or unique healthy housing or environmental health program or activity. Uh, that your organization has been able to sustain at the grant funding. Um, and if you can just describe any practices, you know, for sustainability, because that's not always an easy thing. Mm -hmm. I think um, for sustainability, a lot of our partners are very used to blending funding streams. So being able, if it's a weatherization program, for example, bringing together public and private funds, um, if it's a construction project. Um, our funds are often supporting the pre-development activities and then it's cobbling together financing from different public agencies to actually create the building. Um, in terms of 
just maybe highlighting and maybe grounding some of the work. Um, we just received some reports on the from the grantees, um, progress reports on how they're utilizing the funds and, and meeting the goals that they set out to meet. So I just wanted to share a quick story from Hilltown CDC in, in Massachusetts. Um, and they just highlighted a story. They're assisting a single mother with two children, um, one child who has a disability and they only had a wood stove and during the winter it broke. And so they had no eating source in their home. And so this organization was able to perform an emergency installation of a combined hot water and heating system um, and do new duct work in their home. And they were able to deal with that emergency and, and help that family. And then they were also able to go back and uh, do some more repairs, like fixing a porch that was structurally unsound and installing a new roof. So. That's just one example of um, our amazing partners on the ground and the really vital work they're they're doing. That, that's amazing, and um, being able to provide that level of support, I, I think, just talking to you all just seems to be something of value to help kind of meet that need. And knowing that there are a number of challenges, it's nice to kind of get that positive. Uh, when there's probably a good amount of not so positive, at least to kind of meet the need uh, in some way, uh, somehow. Um, and I'll go to, to Heather. Is there any exciting, and I think you may have uh, been talking about it earlier, but uh, just exciting uh, healthy housing or environmental health program activity uh, that you've been able, that your organization has been able to sustain at the funding? Yeah, so that would be our Healthy Loving Environments uh, program. And that's the one I alluded to before that we partnered up with the, the child care providers. And what was great is uh, we started off by polling them, you know, what days would work for you, um, you know, what times work for you. Because, you know, a lot of our, our providers, they open at, you know, five o'clock in the morning and they don't close up shop until 6 p.m. So when do you train them, right? We learned that getting CE credits was a problem. Um, so there were, it was multifaceted. I mean, and, and our county is very long, so it takes a long time to drive all the way down here if you're if you're north. So um, we decided to go ahead and do this by Zoom. And Zoom is something that we all kind of take for granted, those of us like in the sphere here today, but these are folks who hadn't really done it before. And so like on our first meeting, you could see family members were working the computers and trying to help them get set up. And, and it was just, it was great. That's how much they wanted to take part in the program. And when we started it, we thought we'd get um, like the nine um, owners of of the bigger you know daycares that would that would take part in this, but in the end we ended up with far far more uh, people than that because um, they all wanted their employees to to take the training and so everybody got trained in um, a whole bunch of of environmental health topics everything from um, toxic storage and handling lead radon mercury air quality communicable diseases food safety integrated pest management. They got all kinds of things. Um, and as I mentioned, they got continuing ed credits for that. And then they got small incentive packages every month and then a little bit of an incentive at the end. Um, everybody got, we designed our own logo, more the child care coordinator than I, I'm not that artsy, but, um, and everybody got assigned to place in their yard saying that they completed the program um, and they got a shout out in the newspaper. So that was a big deal. Uh, but I think, I think, Part of the key to the sustainability was that we networked with them. We found out what they needed. We took the program to them. And I think the other thing that you need is you need a champion. You need somebody who believes in that program so much that they're willing to go to the mat for it and say, look, this thing needs to be a priority. And so um, thankfully, you know, that happened in this case and, and we're full now coming into this year. So we have all of those people came back. And, uh, and and some new folks jumped on board. So I think we have pretty much everybody except for, for two child care centers in the county. So yeah, wow. it, it's gathering steam. <laughs> that, that, that's amazing. Uh, and, and I applaud to you uh, and the partners that you've had. Uh, just working with children, that's something that's special to me that you're able to kind of meet the need to help train the, the child caregivers and being able to get them where they need to be. Uh, so that, that's amazing. Um, and, and just sticking with you, Heather, um, I'm curious if this is the same thing, but I'm going to ask anyway, just what is the most exciting thing about the work currently happening uh, in your community uh, more broadly? If you can just kind of share what's 
what's kind of that wow thing or something that you all are really excited about in Wisconsin? I think I think you might smile at this a little bit, Chris, but to me, I think the most exciting thing is that folks like NEHA, folks like the National Center for Healthy Housing, that you all are talking about this on a grander scale. It's not just all of us who are in house who are having these conversations anymore. And rural is starting to be recognized as not just a place, that it's it's a culture, right? So there's a whole culture that goes along with that. And so with that comes all the opportunities and the challenges. There's a lot of, of goodness, but there's some challenges too. I mean, we recognize that a lot of the rural folks, they tend to be proud, they tend to be independent-minded, but they also have challenges, as you, as you mentioned before, transportation, um, getting reliable uh, internet service, or um, some people aren't even comfortable using the internet. So rural has its own, its own challenges, but I'm so glad that now we're starting to talk about those things. Okay. Well, awesome. Yes, uh, it's better late than never. We want to, you, you see that there are challenges and you want to make sure that you're able to effectively meet the need. And that's not always uh, something that's possible, but just bringing those stakeholders together uh, to, with a focus in mind to supporting rural communities is, is something that hopefully that's something that everyone can get behind. Uh, as we kind of get close to uh, ending this panel discussion, uh, Brandon, I did want to go to you. If you could, you know, what could you use more of when it comes to sharing and connecting to other rural communities uh, with similar uh, experiences and challenges? Uh, so if you want to identify any challenges and how can we bring like-minded people together uh, to be able to share some of the things, not reinventing the wheel, but sharing some of those resources that we may come across, how can we kind of bridge that gap? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a wonderful question. Um, I think you know, I would love to make more uh, deep relationships or form more relationships with others that are in the same field, you know, and so I think having some sort of platform to do so is really helpful, whether it's like some sort of, um, you know, a quarterly meeting or work group or some way to make those connections with other professionals in the environmental health or environmental health and safety field um, would be really great. Um, so then you can share ideas and figure out what the emerging problems are that are occurring in your rural communities. And then you can all kind of come together and come up with solutions that might be able to help. And then also share like funding opportunities, because I know that, you know, funding is always an issue in local health jurisdictions and, and coming up with ways to fund solutions within rural communities or even in, in like schools. So I'm, I work with schools all the time. And so they're always short on funding. So I think, um, you know, just coming together and, and brainstorming solutions and then maybe even coming up with work groups that actually come up with products that you can publish and, you know, share out those ideas um, on a nationwide level. Okay, awesome. Thank you for that, Brandon. Um, and I do want to give uh, Keegan and Heather kind of the opportunity just for some final thoughts before we conclude, but thank you, Brandon. Uh, Keegan, I'll go to you next. Any final uh, thoughts before we conclude our panel discussion? I like that question you posed, Chris, about what is exciting right now. And I'm seeing unprecedented resources flowing through the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, through the Inflation Reduction Act. A lot of those programs are just being developed right now. And I think there is a huge and growing need at the intersection of climate and housing justice. Um, we need to be thinking about how we can both address the existing healthy housing needs as we're looking towards the climate of the future. And so if we can tap into those resources to rehabilitate existing homes, to make them more resilient to extreme weather and climate shocks, as well as utilizing those resources to build new homes um, that are also energy efficient, carbon neutral, um, and climate resilient. I think that that's really exciting and a tremendous need. So I just encourage everyone to, to be a part of that process. Awesome, thank you for that, Egan. Heather, final thoughts.
I have to say I'm really encouraged by the things that my fellow panelists are saying. I'm, I'm very optimistic about the things that you all have going on. Um, I like all the ideas about the funding. Um, I, I think that's one challenge for rural is that even if we see it come through in an email or something, part of the, our challenge is that we just don't have time to, to fill out the paperwork. So if anybody out there is listening, if there's anything that you can do to help streamline that process, even if it's something small, we would all really appreciate that. Or even if as part of this platform that, that Brandon was talking about, if you could even find a place to, to dump those um, a little bit easier so that we could find them in one place, um, whatever you could do uh, to support us um, with, with our limited timeframes, it would be so appreciated. Awesome. Well, uh, very great points. Uh, I do want to thank uh, Brandon Kemperman, uh, Keegan Chesney, Heather Blum, uh, just for your thoughts and being able to just uh, share what's going on in the communities that you serve and in the work that you're doing. We greatly appreciate your time uh, and thank you for all the work that you continue to do. So um, as we uh, conclude, I do want to share a few things that I feel like uh, some of the panel have already kind of brought up. And hopefully this is something that we might be able to meet some of those needs. Uh, the fact that uh, we are trying to uh, put together a committee that's focused on rural frontier work. Uh, and this is a QR code. Uh, we would like to share an opportunity for those, uh, for people to work with those like-minded inv individuals to identify gaps, to develop resources, to build partnerships, uh, but also to, to meet that need, uh, to work with professions, to um, be able to come up with items, uh, to be able to connect with others, to be able to share some of the resources that we're kind of coming up with because we've identified that there are unique challenges when it comes to trying to support rural communities. So this is a great opportunity uh, for those that are interested uh, to apply. Um, so the uh, period is open for, we're accepting applications for uh, this Environment Health Rural Committee. Uh, we're looking forward to doing some great work. So feel free to look up that information, uh, capture the QR code, and please reach out uh, if you're interested in being a part of this. Uh, and another opportunity that uh, I think Brandon had even talked about, and Heather may have even, even alluded to it, that we're also working on trying to put together a platform uh, because we know that there is a need and we do want to be able to bring stakeholders together. And that's always been the problem. We kind of live siloed and doing our own work, uh, but not able to always come together and to be able to share resources, share information, but building those networks, knowing that uh, one of your fellow colleagues are going through similar issues and they may have already addressed it. Instead of you racking your mind and trying to address that particular problem, all you have to do is get a resources, maybe connect with said person, uh, maybe identify trainings that may be available or particular um, conferences that are focused specifically on rural communities and supporting those who work and support those. So and even any type of regulatory information or funding avenues, uh, this is a, an opportunity that we would love to build this platform up to be able to try to meet the need for those that are really wanting to kind of connect and be able to be around each other and connect with those things. So uh, please capture those QR codes. We'll share some links in the future uh, and some promotion material, but this is something that we really want to build upon uh, because we know that there's a need, but we need activity in order to keep that going on moving forward and how we can continue to meet the need in that. Uh, so we shared that. And in closing, we do want to thank our panelists. Uh, we want to thank the attendees for being here to listen to some of the work. Uh, we do want you to visit NEHA's uh, and NCH's new webpage that's focused on healthy housing and rural communities. Uh, you see the link that's up there. Uh, please, if you can, just kind of go and check that out. This recording uh, will be available in the future. So if you're not able to capture it now, I uh, will have this posted and available for you to kind of look at it in the future. Uh, so we thank you all for being here. Uh, thank you for being able to listen about some of the unique challenges facing rural communities. Uh, and we thank you for your time. We hope that you've been able to glean something from the discussion. 
as well as some of the up and coming resources that are going to be there to support uh, stakeholders, residents, people living in communities, and those that are supporting those communities. So we do thank you very much for your time. We hope you enjoy the rest of your day and be on the lookout for any future communications dealing with uh, the committee work as well as the community platform. But thank you all very much, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day.